Chapter 2 A great many people unconsciously live their lives around the central irony, victims of a kind of inside joke that the universe plays on people who may be starting to take themselves a bit too seriously. One of the great ironies of Gregory's life was that the kind of life he lived was uneventful, to the point where it could be viewed as a study in uneventfulness. He lived in a small apartment, got around town on an old bicycle, and spent his days delivering restored leather books. He earned a symbolic income from his work, which he didn't need, and as with many persons born to affluence, the entire concept of working for money remained exotic to him. His childhood-instilled sense of ethics told himself that no one could justify just sitting around and doing nothing. But then, he also convinced himself that he wasn't suitable to hold down any other kind of work. So here he was, delivering rare and refurbished books to Wolf's customers. If Wolf had been in the deli business, Gregory would probably have stood at the meat slicer every day. It had been a long time since Gregory had had any direction of his own in his life. It is a situation that many people find themselves in, only Gregory had probably been in it longer than most. At some point, after you've suffered extensively and seen horrific things in the world, and asked yourself all of the key existential questions a thousand nights in a row, after you've drunk enough bourbon to fill a lake and wondered if anything really matters, you discover that you are glad to wake each morning to something as mundane as another day of book deliveries. The key element of a delivery is that someone else gives you the destination and then all you need to do is set out and get there. No need to make decisions. In this way, Gregory's days took on a kind of monk-like simplicity for which he was grateful. He also personally liked Wolf, for whom he had a huge respect, even exceeding anything that Wolf had ever done for him, which was already a lot. Like many young men, Gregory had served in the Great War, and it had almost wrecked him. He had pulled into port in New Orleans in early 1919, conveniently in between two bouts of flu epidemic that ravaged the city, and he had no idea where to even begin in recreating a livable life for himself. He had drifted around in a funk for about eight months when the second flu epidemic hit, and as he had recently rediscovered in himself that the feeling of apathy about whether he lived or died had turned into an active desire to tempt fate to kill him, he volunteered his skills at Charity Hospital. He hoped that the flu might be powerful and exotic enough to do him in, but of course it wasn't. That was where he had met Wolf, who had also determined to volunteer with flu patients. Wolf was an older man, somewhere around his sixties or seventies, so he was apparently less helpful with the carrying of beds and bodies to and fro, but his many years as a bookbinder made him excellent at sewing, and he was thus a natural at helping with wound care and surgical dressings, which were occasionally required in the hospital in general. To have served in the war and seen its unrivaled horrors in person only to now see so many of its survivors and their loved ones perish from this plague, seemed to Gregory like the cruelest twist of fate imaginable. But even despite that, in the midst of the horror and chaos of that time, the older man and the younger man had become friends, and through Wolf, Gregory met Carl, who was then Wolf's closest friend. When Wolf opened a new bookbinding shop on St. Claude Street by Beauregard Square a few years later, 
Gregory joined him. And when they weren't working in the shop, and Carl wasn't traveling to build his far-off cathedral, there were evenings at Wolf's place, with Carl there also, full of the sense of companionship and family that had so long eluded Gregory. That had lasted until just before Carl passed away, and now it was just the two of them. Gregory could not imagine his life without his older friend and mentor, Wolf. He thought of what might become of himself if Wolf had not found him, and the thought always made him shudder. He spent a lot of time with Wolf, but he did not live with him. For starters, that would seem like living with a parent, and Gregory was far too old to still live with a parent. Then, although he prided himself on the fact that he did not have many of them, Gregory knew that Wolf disapproved of his vices. And finally, Gregory knew he had in himself more than a slight streak towards melancholy, of which Wolf was always trying to cure him by making energetic speeches and by preaching at him. For all these good reasons, and perhaps a few others, while Wolf lived in the apartment above his store, Gregory lived alone, in a small apartment, a quick bicycle ride away. Like Wolf's apartment, Gregory's place was filled with old clothes and old books, and they both enjoyed spending evenings listening to music broadcasts on the radio. Unlike Wolf's apartment, Gregory's place also had an unusually ample supply of bourbon on hand, of which Wolf strongly disapproved. Most weeks, Gregory woke up early and attended to his deliveries. Some weeks, however, his recurring chronic hopelessness got the better of him, and he stayed inside for a few days while his deliveries piled up, or else he went out to the place in the country that stabled his horses, which he loved to ride, when all other delights of life seemed to elude him. Then, rested and soothed again, he would wake up one day and jump on his bicycle and pedal out to the store, feeling the wind in his face while riding, just as he did while on horseback, and this always filled him with a free and soothing feeling. Back at the book repair store, his uneventful existence would then resume its normal pace. There were certainly things about Gregory that were noteworthy, even unusual, but besides his recurrent bouts with glumness, the only one that bothered him often and impeded his daily activities was his memory. It seemed to him that he had always had a memory, the consistency of Swiss cheese, but when you have a memory problem, it can be hard to remember exactly when it began. Longer-term memory seemed to hold up well, but his short-term memory was often very leaky. When Wolf told him his delivery destinations, Gregory wrote them down immediately in a small notebook. When Wolf asked him to pick up orders of leather, lanolin, gold paint, or other items, Gregory carefully wrote down all of the quantities. Sometimes he forgot to take his usual thorough notes, but the only time disaster threatened was when he misplaced his small notebook. Still, a notebook could not solve all of his difficulties. People he had interacted with once or twice in the past would come by the store and say hello to Gregory, calling him by his name, and although he knew he had seen their faces before, he couldn't place them, and he did not know who they were. He learned to just smile back and greet them politely, but it was always a bit disconcerting. Wolf knew about Gregory's memory troubles, but the only time he commented on them was when he voiced his theory that it was all probably caused by Gregory's bourbon drinking, a view which Gregory did not believe in the slightest. Gregory thought it much more likely that his memory problems were caused by traumas he had experienced in the past. 
because although his present existence was bland to the point of being almost unbearable at times, his past had been lengthy, dramatic, and vivid. His thus sparsely furnished and unhurried daily life gave him plenty of time to ponder the past, and pondering was one of the things that Gregory was best at. To such persons, the past was wonderful and almost flawless, and certainly infinitely more beautiful and more filled with meaning than the present. This despite all facts to the contrary, and despite all of the awful things that the past had been full of. Gregory was the kind of man who could look back on the childhood of an often lonely and unloved child and imagine it to have been nonetheless filled with brighter sunshine than was still available in the sky today. All sins could be forgiven of the past, but today was riddled with flaws, and he could easily pick out and comment on each one. The certainty that he could not be sent back into the past made it safe and easy to love. Perhaps above all, the past was known. The present and future, however, were vague and untrustworthy, so best not to invest one's heart there. Gregory himself had had a privileged childhood, but it had not been without its difficulties, and it had ended all at once, and rather spectacularly. Now he was the only one left, with all of the rest of his family no longer living, and he would spend a portion of his days still thinking of each of them in turn, as if he were spending time with them. His beautiful but always slightly unapproachable mother, his sweet and playful younger sister, his older brother, to whom he had always looked up, and who had preceded him already long ago to the grave, and his taciturn and suspicious father, for whom nothing Gregory had ever done had been good enough. Gregory's adult life had been overshadowed from the beginning by the traumatic years that had ended his childhood. And at the point in his life when he should have been contemplating marriage and children, he was drifting rudderless and without direction through his days. He had always been exceptionally tall, and although he was on the thin side, his face was handsome, so that women inevitably looked up when he passed. Sometimes that was advantageous, but far more often Gregory just wished that he could be invisible. Women had always been an important part of his life, but he had not had many long-lasting or deep relationships aside from those with his mother and sister. He was both wary of women and also easily spellbound by them and in the most significant relationship he had ever had with a woman, she had held all the cards, and he had resigned himself to thinking he could not do otherwise than to obey in whatever she asked of him, feeling at the same time that she was taking advantage of his yielding nature. As cats preferred to play with running mice rather than with seemingly dead ones, her interest in him had not even lasted for half a year. When she left, after an initial phase of hurt and despair, he realized he did not really care, that he felt rather good to be free of her, and that he was in no hurry to replace her with anyone new. Even years later, he thought he would rather go through fire than to see her again, and he was very glad that she had mercifully gone away on her own, because it was unlikely that he ever would have been courageous enough to throw her out of his life. A part of him was still afraid that she might return, and that she could still make him do her bidding. 
and that that hadn't worked out all that well for him before. So he made a pact with his mind to avoid thinking even of her name. Otherwise, his feelings about love remained extremely idealistic, if theoretical, probably since they came from implausible childhood adventure books, rather than from any mature and insightful place. He loved the country, but thought he couldn't live in it anymore. He loved children, but knew he himself would never have any of his own, and he enjoyed writing, but only ever used it to write melancholy notes to himself in a journal that he kept. His melancholy had been a part of him for as long as he could remember, and when he turned from a child into a young man, it became acute. Now he could go for weeks sometimes in a seemingly happy-go-lucky state, but always eventually his misery would return, and the bottom would fall out of it all. Then the book deliveries would pile up for a few days, until Gregory felt better and felt like seeing the rest of the world again. He did not imagine that he could do anything about this, did not think that he had any hand in its causes, and did not think that any reaction was required from him, besides staying in bed and pulling the covers up over his head whenever his personal sky was filled with these storm clouds. Sometimes he did have the thought that if he could do something about these clouds, he might just be able to make something constructive out of his existence. But that idea had the same uncertainty about it as did all thoughts of the future, and at this point he always readily veered instead to thoughts of the past. To his credit, he was not entirely a layabout. On Friday and Saturday evenings, if he felt like he wanted to go out and live in the world, Gregory would leave his existence of book restoration deliverer temporarily behind and go out to the theater or to the opera or to a concert. It was entertainingly funny to him to think that he was the only delivery man in town who had ever held a loge at the French Opera House, at least for the few brief months he had been in town before it burned down. Now he often attended performances at the municipal auditorium, from which it was a short distance back home, and he would make his way back to a small, meticulously kept apartment where, at some point, before Monday morning, he would turn back into Wolf's reliable, if overqualified and overdressed, delivery man. It hadn't always been this neat and dull of an existence, of course. The lonely routine that he lived with now was not the kind of life that an average young man would choose for himself, unless some past trauma had first broken in him the typical ambitions of life. Seeing war up close had done a number on him, and it wasn't even the only problem he had. Gregory's view of himself now was that he was a sad, secret hero, but that nobody knew it, and nobody could be told, because it was unmanly to discuss one's sorrows out loud. In a culture in which men were not permitted to publicly indulge in very much emotion, Gregory had the misfortune of being born an emotionally sensitive creature. Much of his subsequent personality was built up around himself as an attempt at self-defense or to simply hide behind. As his life had gone on, he had accumulated on top of this other secrets and sufferings that could not be told or explained to anyone. And thus the barrier between himself and everyone else had only grown higher. His unknown, deepest wish, as with all people who harbor dark and painful secrets, was to be able to tell all of it to someone, and to have that someone remain unperturbed and brave, so that Gregory, too, could then feel less afraid of these hidden things. It was impossible, of course but longing for the unattainable 
always came easily to him. Other people did not have these struggles. He was sure of it. Other people did not have the kind of challenges that he had. Other people went through life dry-eyed and certain of what they wanted and where they were going. Other people were contented with themselves. Obviously, other people had something that Gregory did not have. But he could not figure out what it might be. Being unable to ask anyone about it, he lay around and thought with alternating curiosity and jealousy what he was missing. But in the foreground, he hid all of this behind his well-tailored suits, non-committal smile, and loyal dedication to the small tasks of his job. This, then, was Gregory's entire daily world, up until the moment that he rounded that fateful corner, caught a glimpse of the girl in the white and sky-blue summer dress. She was slender and graceful, and had hair of just a certain color, making his heart catch in his chest. Oh, there was loveliness here, but there was also something strangely familiar. He began to wonder if he had seen her before, and where that might have been, and he was so focused on following this thread of thought into the tangled mass of thoughts and dusty memories that crowded the inner part of his cerebellum. And that was when he hit the empty milk crate with his front wheel. He landed on a tangled heap of delivery books, bicycle parts, and the hard limbs of two individuals stretched prone on the sidewalk. It all happened in the proverbial flash of an instant. The fall rattled his teeth in his head, and he may have lost consciousness for a moment, but he rallied quickly. He sat up, rubbed his elbow in his head where it ached, and then he reached over to the first prone body, that of a small boy. Where had he come from? Hey there, little fellow, Gregory said raggedly. Are you all right? The boy's eyes flew open. He looked disoriented, and the bump on the back of his head had already begun to form. But there was no blood, and he did not look that much worse for wear. Ah, of course, the legendary resilience of small children, Gregory told himself. Gregory took a reflexive, deep breath of relief. That was when an acrid tang began to fill his nostrils. At first he thought it was just the after-effect of being dropped so suddenly on the sidewalk from a height, but then as he looked over at the prone body of the girl, he saw what it was. Unlike the boy, she did not open her eyes, and the bottom of her dress was covered by a blood stain that was expanding dreadfully as he watched. It was fine in the hospital or the battlefield, where he had trained himself to never inhale, but unexpected blood-filled emergencies were a weak point for him. This one was worse than anything that he had ever experienced in peacetime. Her blood was redolent with a delicate, 
floral, feminine scent that was somehow horribly appealing, and that just made it all the worse. It moved slowly across the sidewalk to him, flowing with purpose, as if intent on personally seeking him out, and the nearer it got, the more certain he was that none of his other agitations about blood had ever been as intense as this. He felt his eyes almost roll up into his head and his limbs go taut with a sudden springing energy that he had spent years tightening his control over and that he was proud at being able to keep suppressed at will. Now, suddenly, all control was gone and he was like a wild beast, no mind at all, no restraint, not a single human-worthy thought left in him. He was coming unglued, shaking. Gregory put a hand over his mouth and fought down the horror in himself. Then he remembered the boy again. Calling on all of his remaining self-control, he closed off his nose, pulled himself up, and grabbed his fallen packages. He pulled the boy carefully to his feet with his other hand. Little fellow, he said hoarsely to him, do you think you can go into the station and see if the policeman can call for an ambulance? The lady is badly injured. The boy's eyes were wide, and his chin trembled as he nodded. For an instant, Gregory was not at all certain that the boy would do as he had been told. Gregory grabbed his arm, lightly twisted, and then growled. Listen, kid, it's really important. If you aren't back here with the policeman in three minutes, I will tear you limb from limb. Got that? The boy began nodding furiously, a movement which clearly made him dizzy because he staggered a few steps in the wrong direction before taking off running for the entrance to the Basin Street station. Gregory could still smell the blood, no matter what he tried to do, and watching its progress along the sidewalk made the hairs on the back of his neck stand on end and his knees go weak. In the war, he had seen men staggering about trying to hold their own guts in with their hands, blood pouring down their bodies in rivers. He had seen men gassed and bleeding from their lungs and their eyes. Oh, the things that he had seen in the war. He pulled himself and his packages away toward the side of the nearest building, sat down on the sidewalk, turned his head away, and did his best to stop breathing altogether. It was all he could do to keep from fleeing, but he had to make sure the girl got help. Each second seemed to last several unbearable hours long. A man ran out of a shop down the street and approached the girl, bending down to take a closer look. Unthinkingly, Gregory growled at him. He had better not think to touch her. Oh, my apologies, sir. I didn't see you there. I heard the crash. Are you all right? Has someone called for help? The man inquired, looking over at Gregory. Yes, I sent a small boy that got tangled up with us over to the station to ask for help. Gregory replied. He winced as he spoke, wishing for the millionth time in his life that he had the magical ability to make himself invisible. What he must look like to this man, fully hale and hearty, sitting and shaking on the other side of the pavement, while a young girl bled to death in front of him in the summer sun. He wondered if running away would really be so very awful, but then he imagined that he could read the man's thoughts, and that the man was making notes to himself to recount later for the police report. First I saw him carelessly mow down two pedestrians, and then he left the woman injured in the road while he ran away like the coward that he no doubt is. The man, however, did not look at Gregory again or attempt to come near him. Instead, he walked over to the girl and looked her over. I'd say her leg is broken, judging from the unnatural angle that it's in. Ah, and here comes the boy. A nasty accident, this. Very unfortunate. The boy raced up, with two policemen running behind him. An ambulance has already been called, shouted one of the policemen. The boy ignored him. He ran right up to Gregory and asked, May I go home now, please? His voice shook with shock and fear. Gregory nodded. 
The boy zipped down the street and vanished. Hey, hold up, you, called one of the policemen. But the boy was already gone. All right, so what happened here, asked the first policeman, taking a notebook and pencil out of his pocket. You, what is your name, sir, and your address? Gregory Morgan, choked out Gregory, and then he choked out his address. It was getting hard to hold his breath for so long under the circumstances. You drove the bicycle that hit this lady? The second policeman asked, eyebrows lifting. Gregory nodded weakly. By way of explanation, he pointed at the empty milk crate, now strewn in pieces along the periphery of the scene of the accident. It hadn't been so much a bicycle accident as an airborne attack. He and the metal he had been riding on had come down on her from a height and with considerable weight. Ah, I see, said the first policeman, taking down another note. Then he took down the name of the gentleman who had come to assist. While all this was happening, additional people came out of the buildings and started to cluster around. What was it that made people so eager to see someone profusely bleeding? Gregory wondered. Still sitting with his back, against the building's wall. He turned his head away and tried to hide his intense suffering from the other onlookers. He wanted to flee, but his morality would not allow it until he had seen that the injured girl was taken care of. The crowd was getting quite large by the time the ambulance came into view, and when the ambulance orderlies climbed out, the police had to assist in clearing a path. A broken leg for sure. Maybe additional breaks also, said the orderly to one of the policemen. Quite a lot of damage for a bicycle accident, I'd say. How did you even manage this? What bad luck. The orderlies got to work with the stretcher. One of the policemen leaned over to the orderlies, said something quietly to them, and then pointed over at Gregory, who had pulled out a handkerchief that he now held over his mouth struggling with the urge to run away that surged through all of his limbs. The stretcher was loaded into the ambulance, and then one of the orderlies came over to Gregory. "'Are you sure you shouldn't come too?' he asked, looking carefully into Gregory's eyes, probably searching for signs of concussion. "'For what reason?' asked Gregory. He knew that he would never last a ride in a small enclosed space with the girl, well, either he wouldn't last or she wouldn't, because he would undoubtedly lose his mind. I was thinking because of your arm, said the orderly, pointing at Gregory's right shirt sleeve. For the first time, Gregory looked down. To his surprise, his upper arm had a long, bleeding gash in it, easily visible through the torn fabric of his shirt and suit jacket. Bleeding never a good situation, was now a frightening one to him, and he had been so overwhelmed by the sticky fragrance of the girl's blood that he had never even realized he had also been injured. Best to get away from here, he thought, before anyone commented on the unusual shade and thick viscosity of his blood. It was one of his unusual, but largely unnoticed, personal attributes, and Gregory was eager to keep it that way. He looked away, still feeling light-headed, and shook his head. No, no, I'll be fine. I have a doctor who can sew this back up for me. No need for anything. The orderly shrugged and began walking back to the ambulance. Wait! Gregory suddenly called after him. His own bleeding, as concerning as it was, had to wait for a moment. The girl was important now. To which hospital are you taking her? Why, to charity, of course, replied the orderly as he climbed into the back of the ambulance. The door shut behind him and the vehicle lurched forward. The onlookers parted ranks to let the ambulance through. The wail of the siren was soon gone down the block. Gregory stood up, brushed off the concerns of those who approached him with quick assurances that he was fine, picked up the bicycle and milk crate parts, and stacked them in a neat stack on the curb, and walked away, his delivery packages under his good arm. 
one of the paper bundles had its brown wrapper partially torn off, and what had happened to the book underneath remained to be seen. Wolf would not be happy. His own blood oozing down his arm did not bother him, but it did make for awkwardness, walking through the streets. Gregory cursed under his breath and wished for the millionth time in his life that he could be invisible. And he hurried back to the shop. Once there, he pushed through the front door, walked up to the counter, and dropped the bundles down. Wolf, he called. Not getting a reply, he pushed the small bell set out on the counter. In a few more minutes, Wolf appeared. He looked at the bundles first. Ach, mein Gott, Gregor, was ist denn das? What a mess! You have never failed me yet with any delivery. What happened to these? asked Wolf. Well, my bicycle flew out from under me after I hit a milk crate left in the street. I flattened a small boy and a young girl. It was rather gruesome, explained Gregory casually. Say, do you think you could sew this up? Wolf had torn back the brown paper cover from the most destroyed bundle and gingerly touched the torn leather of the new book cover with his skilled fingers. Well, I suppose I could. Oh, this poor book. No, not that. This, said Gregory, sticking out his right arm. Of course Wolf would notice injured books before he would notice an injured person. Anyone who had spent even three days with Wolf would expect this and not be surprised by it. Oh, that, said Wolf, adjusting his glasses and taking a close look at Gregory's torn skin. Well, I suppose if I don't fix that first, you'll just bleed all over my other books. Into the back with you, then. Here, let me hang out the closed-for-lunch sign. It would be best if we were not disturbed. Gregory had had years in which to perfect both suffering and being a good patient. He held very still and complained very little. As he watched Wolf work, he suspected that it made little difference to Wolf whether he was sewing together a book binding or whether he was sewing up human flesh with surgical thread. Books were almost human to Wolf, and he took the same level of care with them as he did with wounds. Also, blood did not seem to bother Wolf, another useful trait in a surgeon. As he worked, Wolf spoke to himself in his native German. He shook his head and looked puzzled. You hit a milk crate, you say? I would not think that that would cause you so much injury. You, the indestructible war hero. Gregory did not really hear him. His attention had drifted back to the girl. If her leg was indeed broken, how long would they hold her at the hospital? What if she had sustained so many internal injuries that she wouldn't recover? Wolf was going on about the stubbornness of young men who refused to see that they were not uninjurable, but Gregory paid him little heed. Gregory felt he had to go to the hospital today to attempt to learn what had become of the girl. It would be dreadful to have her on his conscience should she die, but at the same time he felt like he simply had to know her fate. He looked down at his arm, and it appeared that Wolf was almost half done. I suppose you aren't going to make me sit here all day once you finish holding my arm up in the air or some other nonsense like that, growled Gregory. Oh, please, Gregor, said Wolf. I have less hopeless things to do today than to try to keep you stationary. But what is your hurry? You can postpone these deliveries for a day or two. Go home and rest. And I know you will need to go and purchase a new bicycle. Bicycle? asked Gregory. Who said anything about shopping for a bicycle? I have to check on the girl. What girl? Now Wolf was confused. Gregory sighed. The girl I hit. I told you. It was quite ghastly. Oh, the girl, said Wolf. Say, she wasn't one of your impossibly beautiful, long-haired, blonde creatures, was she? Funny, said Gregory in a cutting tone of voice. The stitching was uncomfortable, and having to endure a morality lecture at the same time made it that much worse. 
To be honest, after I hit her, I did not pay much attention to the color of her hair. I mostly just noticed the spreading pool of blood around her. Oh, said Volf, that could not have been easy for you. No, said Gregory with a shiver. I would have fled the scene, but did not want to be accused of a hit and run by the police. And I was also worried that I would have her death on my conscience if she failed to get help in time. There was also a small boy involved, but he seemed unhurt and ran away. Who would imagine that a bicycle could cause so much trouble? Perhaps we should all have stayed with horses after all. Now hold still, said Wolf. In another couple of minutes the stitching was done. Gregory reached into his pocket and pulled out the small notepad that he always carried with him, and his pencil. Under the day's date and location of the morning's planned deliveries, he drew a line, and then jotted down everything he could remember about the accident, including its date and time and its exact location. He wrote a note to himself that the girl was at Charity Hospital. From past experience with his faulty memory, he knew that the more he noted down now, the less he would curse himself for misremembering in a few days' time. There were few things more frustrating than reaching out for memory and not finding it where it was supposed to be. For some reason, he had the feeling that this accident was going to be important to later recall, and it gnawed at his conscience to have no further information on the extent of the girl's injuries which he in his carelessness had caused. Guilt was a natural part of his glass-half-empty mindset, and he eagerly let it wash over him. It felt familiar as home. Gregory thanked Volf for the medical services, and then he went home to change his shirt and jacket. It was a boringly long walk without his bicycle, he realized, and there was no way that he could make all of his book deliveries on foot. So he spent the afternoon looking for a new bicycle, as Wolf had suggested. His heart was not really in it, though, because he kept worrying about the girl. How could he have been so oblivious that he had missed a large milk crate right in front of him? As fast as his reflexes usually were, how had he dropped through time and space so completely that he had apparently left his body for a while? It made no sense. Maybe he had briefly lost consciousness? It was very puzzling. He drifted through the rest of the day, with his attention constantly wandering, and then towards early evening Gregory made his way over to the hospital to inquire about her state. He did not have much information to go on, except to say he was looking for a girl who had been injured in a street accident earlier in the day. "'Young man, we have several of those in this hospital on any given day. You will need to provide me with some more specific information.' "'A name, perhaps?' asked the scary-looking nun, serving as the front-desk nurse for the evening. Gregory shook his head. "'Are you some kind of family relation? A friend?' Uh, no, I'm afraid not. It is rather awkward, but, uh, I, I happen to be the one who, who ran over her uh, with my bicycle out by the Basin Street station earlier today, replied Gregory, awkwardly shuffling his feet. Oh, I see, said the nun, looking up at him sternly now. I will see if I can find out her name for you, so you can come by again and make your apologies to her in person. If that should fail... Or if you should come too late, I would advise you as a good Christian to go and make your peace with your conscience at the confessional at the cathedral. Gregory gulped. He hadn't been in a church in years, but nuns still scared him badly. The nun shuffled off to get the information, and he sat down to wait. If he should not find this girl, if she should die, if he hadn't been so incapacitated immediately after the accident, and now it was all his fault— and he was tossing a handful of earth into the open grave while her family berated him for his carelessness and cowardly actions. In his imaginative, gloomy, and over-emotional mind, he had gone all the way to annual night-long vigils on his knees by her graveside when the nun reappeared. Gregory jumped. "'I have a name for you, young man,' said the nun. "'Her name is Mademoiselle Prevet." 
The doctors are performing her surgery later this evening. Now go home and think on your actions, and try to interact with God's creation with more care in the future. And if I see you back here again with inquiries about other persons whom you have driven over or otherwise injured, do not expect me to assist you again in making your apologies. Gregory thanked her, vigorously assured her that he would not be back with any future inquiries, and then he grabbed his hat and leaped out into the night. Once safely outside, he took out his notebook and added his final pieces of information. Angry nun and Mademoiselle Prevet. Then he wound his way slowly home, taking care to not even so much as bump any passing pedestrians. A few days later, he reappeared at the familiar, white-pillared main entrance to the hospital, with his new bicycle, and with a large bouquet of yellow and orange gerberas and ranunculus. He tied up the bicycle and walked in, hoping that the bouquet was large enough to hide him as he came up to the front desk, but then he noticed with relief that the nun from the other day was not on duty. The new nurse directed him to the correct part of the hospital, where Mademoiselle Prevet was recovering. He passed soundlessly through the corridors and to the area where her room was to be found. As he approached where she was supposedly resting, which was filled with multiple other recovering patients, a nurse came towards him and asked him what he wanted. He pointed to the bouquet and explained that he was delivering it for Mademoiselle Prevet. The nurse took the bouquet, returned a moment later with a water-filled vase, put the flowers into the room on the window sill next to one of the beds, and told him that he would not be able to visit with the patient because Mademoiselle Prevet was sleeping. He asked if the nurse had any information about the patient's health, and the nurse told him that it looked as if the patient was getting past the worst of it. The femoral artery in her leg had been sewn up before too much blood loss had occurred. The ribs turned out to have been only cracked and not broken, and the bone in her leg had been reset. Gregory took in the information with a huge sense of relief and told the nurse he would be back the next day. He came the next day, and the next, and the next again, but he had no luck in getting in to see her. It was a number of days and several bouquets later before he found... Mademoiselle Prevet awake. The nurse went over to see if the patient might agree to see a visitor, and then she returned and indicated that Gregory was to take this latest bouquet in himself. Guilt, curiosity, and discomfort all coursing through him, Gregory carefully approached the patient's bed. There she sat, looking pale and unhappy, her body hidden by the white of the hospital bedding. He stepped nearer, wondering suddenly exactly what he should say to this unknown person. One side of her face was still covered with a yellowish-brown bruise, and that was what Gregory saw as he first approached her bed. I uh, excuse me, mademoiselle, uh, forgive the intrusion. The patient turned her head. A pair of sharp, questioning eyes glanced up at him, then widened in surprise. It felt as if she was looking at him and taking him in in great detail, trying to sort out in her mind where they might have met. Telling her wasn't going to be very pleasant. There was a long pause while she stared at him, and then finally the girl asked, "'Excuse me, but do I know you?' Well, uh, how to put it, I have been hoping for days now that you would be well enough to receive me. I have another bouquet for your collection, he said, gesturing towards the wide window sill, which was filling up with bouquet-laden vases. Uh, may, may I pull up a chair, he asked, setting his hat and his latest bouquet down on the empty bed next to hers. Maybe it would be better to try to apologize to her from an angle nearer to her face he knew from experience that people disliked when he swooped down on them from a great height and began talking down at them. 
The girl nodded, her eyes wide, and following him as he moved, her features uncertain, as if still deciding what she should think. Are you at the hospital? she asked. No, I'm not. I confess it with great pain, but I am, in fact, the bicyclist who crashed into you, he said awkwardly. I was hoping to see you get well and to tell you how very sorry I am for the accident. Oh, said the girl in a low voice, and she looked down at her small, pale hands. This was not going too well, Gregory thought. Uh, yes, well, I can see how you might not be very glad to make my acquaintance, but I did feel terrible about it, and I wanted to make sure you were all right. There was an empty milk crate left on the sidewalk, and I, and I didn't see it, you know, and... There was a red balloon, the girl interrupted. I remember a red balloon. The boy had it, and it got away from his grasp. And I was watching it get carried off. A red balloon? What red balloon? asked Gregory, puzzled, sitting down hesitantly at the very edge of the hard metal chair that he had pulled over to the bed. You didn't see the balloon? Then what were you looking at, that you didn't see the milk crate in your way? asked the girl. Gregory reached back into his mind and tried to remember. It was easy. The answer lay right there, exactly where it was supposed to be. You, he said emphatically. I was looking at you. The girl gave him an uncomfortable look, and her healthy cheek had a blush sweep over it. On her bruised cheek, the blush added another messy hue to the blotchy color palette which was already there. It was not a good look. I'm sorry, that did not come out as I had intended, said Gregory. Please do not take offense, mademoiselle. What I meant to say is that I suddenly saw you there on the sidewalk in front of me, and I, and I wondered if we'd met before. I never noticed the balloon. The girl gave him another searching look. And we haven't met before? she asked again. As to that, I'm still uncertain, Gregory replied. It does not seem very likely. Yes, now that we are speaking together, I rather think that we have not met before. By the way, my name is Gregory Morgan. He reached a hand across to her. She hesitated, but he couldn't tell if she was going to take it or not, so he waited a while and then pulled it back again, feeling a bit hurt, but realizing maybe her hands were injured as well. I don't know if this has ever happened to you before, but sometimes the feeling of familiarity is quite strong. My memory is not the best, so I'm often not certain. His voice trailed off as he caught the shift in her expression. Her eyes now bored holes into him. There was a momentary awkward silence. Then one way to think of it, said the girl, unhappily pulling on her white bedsheet, is that if I am not who you thought I might be, you drove over me for no good reason at all. She turned her head away again. Well, there was the milk crate there, as I tried to explain, Gregory began again. Then he looked at her face and stopped himself. She did not want him there, and she did not want to hear his excuses. No, you are right. I humbly beg your pardon for all the injury that I have caused you. Sometimes things really do happen for no good reason at all. Please accept my deepest regrets. He stood up, moved the chair back to its place by the wall and picked up his hat. I wish you a speedy recovery, he said quickly, and a good day. Please do enjoy these flowers. I won't trouble you further. He reached down for his hat, lifted it off of the bed, and straightened himself back up. A shuffling sound brought along a nurse, who approached the patient's bed. Vivian, your mother is on her way. She is speaking with the doctor now. Gregory froze. Something suddenly rendered him motionless like an insect, being adhered by a long needle to a specimen collector's carton board. He wished desperately that his memory was better, felt certain that there was something there, 
tickling him just beyond reach. He slowly turned around. Vivian. Is your name Vivian? he asked. Vivian, Vivian. Was it possible? Good God, but how unlikely such a thing must be. Yes, replied the girl. V-I-V-I-E-N. Why? Is that also the name of the person you are trying to remember? There was an injured sarcasm in her tone that he heard, but did not completely register in his mind as something that he might need to do anything about. His mind had been handed a new puzzle, and he was intent on trying to figure it out. You know, I think it just might be, he said at last, wondering how to prove it to her. And then an idea struck him. Listen, I have to go and find something to show you. I will be back. And without waiting for her reaction, he sped excitedly out of the room, just as Madame Marie Prevet was entering into it. Oh, many pardons, madame, he said, glancing round to make sure the nun from the front desk hadn't been there to see him bump into someone. Then he dashed out into the street, jumped onto his new bicycle, and raced home. <laughs>